All right, so this video is going to be a little different uh, compared to what's normally on this channel, but I figure I was trying to find a video like this on YouTube, and I didn't really find a whole lot, so hey, if you can't find it, make it. So today we are going to look into reflow ovens. <laughs> and uh, if you've seen one of these before, this is a toaster oven where you make food. But we are going to stop making food and start making chips, specifically circuit boards. So I got a new batch of boards in, really excited. Got a lot of SMD components on here, as you can see. Got some fan controllers, got some scan tools, and uh, chips and SMD pads out the wazoo. And all the components to go with. So that should be fun. Previously, when I'd build boards like this, I'd use uh, our little quick 861D. And uh, it's basically just a hot air gun. You pick it up. And it's got a nozzle, and you heat the components up with hot air and melt all the solder. It works, but uh, I definitely have to turn the temperature down on that, because I'm pretty sure I was uh, cooking voltage regulators and things like that because I had it too hot. I'd like to do it more professionally, because with this it's a little harder to know the exact temperature, and there's, there's a lot of guesswork, and it's just kind of eh. It works for rework, but for actually reflowing an entire board, it's not the most ideal. So... To start this bad boy off, we have ourselves a controller. More, so, uh, more specifically, this is the Tiny Reflow controller made by uh, Rocket Screen. So this little guy, there you go, Tiny Reflow controller. This little guy is designed to uh, turn any normal toaster oven into a reflow oven. Very simply, it's got uh, an input for a thermocouple so we can read our current temperature. And it's also got an output to a solid state relay. And uh, basically it just blinks a, um, a relay on and off to try to control the temperature. So if we come over here, uh, I actually have the serial monitor hooked up so we can read the incoming temperature. So we got the time, the temperature set, the actual temperature, and how long the relay's on for in milliseconds. So it's got a little serial output. Uh, this doesn't have a serial chip on it, so I'm actually using a Teensy as a serial converter. <laughs> Most expensive way to do it, right? But uh, yeah, it's actually got a couple inputs on there. We got TX, RX, VIN, ground, and uh, whatever the heck DTR is. Maybe some kind of reset. It's also a reset button there. But this is a nice cheap controller. It was like 25, 30 bucks, which is like one of the cheapest setups you can get. So if you want to build it all yourself, this is probably the way to go. I'm excited. It's open source. You can find the, uh, the code on GitHub. And um, with the free pens broken out, we might be able to do other things. I might be able to recode it to um, open up a servo or things like that. So, yeah, I like open source because I know how to Arduino. Once you learn, man, you get hooked, you get addicted. So, with this thermocouple, this is a temperature probe. So, when I hold it with my finger, you can see the temperature goes up. And it's actually really fast to update. I'm impressed. So, when I let go of this, look how quickly that drops. I couldn't believe that, because like most probes, they have like a lot of, um, I guess, thermal mass, so it takes a while for them to uh, change, but that's real quick. But anyway, this is going to be the controller that we use to turn the oven on and off, but there's some other things we need to do to the oven. Uh, safety warning. You know, we're tampering with mains power. 120 volts in America. You don't want to mess with this, all right? If you don't know what you're doing, get some help or have someone else do it because this you, you don't want to mess this up all right big safety warning here don't try this at home if you're not comfortable with it you can potentially burn your house down be careful with this stuff so now that that's out of the way what we're going to do is disconnect the power to our tubes we got two little heating tubes uh elements in here and what we're going to do is hook them up to a solid state relay hook our controller up and insulate it another thing i've heard is insulating is good so it makes it uh, more efficient. It can heat up faster, and it holds the temperature better. So in order to insulate it, we've got two things here. So first up, if you've seen any of the kits or builds online, you've probably seen this gold reflective tape before. It's heat tape. Uh, the important part here is finding tape that is actually good up to the temperature you're going to use. We're going to be up to like 260 degrees Celsius, or 450-ish Fahrenheit. So you want to make sure that you have tape that can actually withstand that. And this is going to go inside the oven to help reflect the uh, the heat back in and seal up any little air gaps. Uh, and next up, the what I feel is going to be the more important part is actual insulation. So this is ceramic fabric. This is meant for like kennels, 
uh, little ovens, grills, things like that. This is super, super good at insulating very high temperatures. This, this stuff can go up to like a ridiculous amount. So you can actually see right here, it's a ceramic fiber blanket. So this is half inch thick and it's like 12 inch by 24 inch, I think. So that should go pretty well. I'm gonna use gloves for this because uh, I don't want to get fibers all up in my fingers. I don't know if this is as bad as other insulations, but you don't want to mess with it. I'm sure it's a pretty bad skin irritant. Um, but we're going to make this one interesting. I know I'm talking a lot, but I want to see just how effective uh, insulation is. And do you really need to do this to your oven? All the builds talk about it, but they don't really give you data. So I want to give you guys some data. So we got our little Hamilton Beach doodad over here. I got this at Walmart for, I think, $25. I actually opted for the cheaper version. So this one doesn't stick out as much as the $30 one everyone recommends. And it's still an 1100 watt oven. So, same heat, and uh, it's in cool red. But yeah, for 25 bucks, you can't go wrong. And why not buy an actual reflow oven? Well, the cheap ones on eBay go for like 300 plus. They're only infrared, and they suck balls. They burn components, they're uneven, and they're just plain bleh. So, why not make your own for half the price that's more better? I like more better. Uh, there's other controllers out there. There's a really simple one, the Reflowster. It literally just plugs into the outlet and everything is done here. So it just turns the power on and off continuously. So you'd set it up like that. That thing's like 140 bucks, ready to go. No modding required. I was kind of looking at that. That was neat. You also got other things like the Controlio, uh, which is a lot more expensive, but a lot more, um, a lot more features. But I like going cheap, so I didn't go that way. So I went with the tiny Reflow controller for 30 bucks. And I paid the extra shipping to get it here quick. I ordered it Thursday. It was here Monday. It's awesome. All the way from Malaysia. <laughs> so anyway, enough blabbing. But we're going to run it without insulation. Then we're going to insulate it and see how much faster it is. Those of you guys that say MacBooks aren't good for anything. The backs make great heat shields. <laughs> so here's the setup. And I already messed it up. Lovely. So we've got ourselves a test board inside. And uh, I want to get the thermal couple as close as possible. I actually took the uh, the crumb tray out of the bottom and we're going to put it in the middle. Uh, one of the important things is having um, a smaller amount of, uh, I guess, non-important metal. Because that's that'll absorb some of the heat. You want a, the least amount of extra crap in there as possible. So all the heat goes to the board and just heating up the unit. So, uh, yeah, we took out... All that crap. I wanted to put the tray in the bottom, but it doesn't fit. So, we got a thermocouple. I got a crappy board in here that's dead. So we're just going to have that as a stand-in, just to see if it does anything. And we got our little guy set up here. Again, it doesn't have any control, so we're really just using it for temperature monitoring. And we got a big, long USB cord to go to the computer. And we'll log the temperature and see how it does. Cool. Uh, one of the mods we are going to make is uh, we're going to take the top um heater and put it in the bottom because the top one is usually um uh, usually more powerful and you want the more powerful one on the bottom for reflow ovens so we'll switch that around now, this is pretty cool i like this i can i can feel the heat coming off the uh, the front glass is a major uh spot for the heat slight bit on the top not really much in the back so yeah Putting some of that reflective tape on the window is going to be a huge, um, it's, it'll keep the heat in a lot better, especially the air gaps around the door. All right, we'll let that sit and uh, get back to you with some data. So this right here is our Reflectigold uh, tape. Uh, I think it's like fiberglass tape or something like this. So we're gonna put that all over. I'm gonna leave a nice little window in the uh, door and then uh, cover it all up. So this right here is uh, two inch thick by 30 foot. And uh, there's a lot of 15-foot rolls. I'm like, oh, that might be okay. But then I did a little basic geometry to uh, figure out the area inside there. And 30-foot uh, was definitely a better uh, option. Better have a little bit more. Uh, for 10 bucks more, you get twice as much. So, eh, figured it was worth it. Okay, so we got the cover off. Relatively flimsy, kind of easy to wiggle off. Uh, the entire red piece, it's its own little section that kind of comes off. It's stuck over on this side. So you can see everything behind the switches. 
We've got our uh, temperature knob over here. I was always curious how this thing works. I have no idea, some kind of weird, I guess, metallic heat sensing thing. It's really interesting. Then we've got the timer module, which acts as the switch, and uh, the little dinghy bell, which is, I think, completely mechanical. Neat. It shares a common ground between the two heater elements. Uh, only issue is, it looks like this was installed after the fact, where the uh, heat, like the, the heater modules were, you know, like bent and tacked. So they're not very easily replaceable. You can't just swap them out. You have to figure out how to reattach them. So that's kind of annoying. They're also, I guess it's, yeah, it's everything's just cut, bent, and put into place. So good luck trying to ever <laughs> change them. You can see the door mechanism over here with the spring. Fairly simple. So yeah, I guess we'll just have to find a good spot for a uh, thing to plug into. Figure out where the heck all these wires are going to. Okay, check it out. Ooh, baby. A little fancy. I think that's looking pretty good. So I started out with a strip on the top. And uh, if you notice, I let the edges overhang a bit. And that is on purpose. Because if you look up here... When it closes, it helps seal. I kind of messed up a little there because it was cut sideways from the factory. But look at that. It seals that up. So now there's a lot less, if uh, any, air loss now. Very nice, very nice. Now the other cool part is this strip down here, I didn't have to cut. It's uh, this part right here just doesn't like actually touch. And it can fold properly, so you can see the uh, the angulations there. So that's cool. So the probably one of the biggest areas that we have to worry about is now coated. So hopefully that helps a bit. And if we take this guy, put it in there. Look at that! We got a perfect little window in there. That's awesome. Check that out. Just an itty bitty little gap in there so you can see when the heater's on, but that's cool. Sweet! So now that the case is off, we can see that there's gaps like around here. You got gaps all the way around. So we'll have to um, try to coat. The, the corners would probably be the most important parts to hit if you could only do a little bit. So I'm going to see just how much I can cover. Okay, so we're starting to seal up the corners over here. I ended up cutting this into two halves just because it's easier to work with. I'm trying to make it bend around all the indents and all that real pain in the butt. You can see back here this one didn't want to quite sit down, but that's okay. We'll cover it as we go. Got a piece of wire holding the, uh, the door open so that we can work on the bottom, or I guess the top. So I've been focusing on the corners first, because that's the important part, sealing up any... Uh, <coughs> open areas and then I'll fill in the rest so I figure next what I'll do is I'll start on things that aren't insulated um, by the cover so the bottom and the back are uh, both exposed so I'm going to cover them up first and then after that I'll probably do the top and then maybe whatever left uh, I'll try and do the sides maybe we're getting kind of small might be able to make it but uh, yeah for the back this one's a bit more complicated if you notice I cut it in the middle and then I just slowly work my way down to try and uh, get it to fold in and sit against the other uh, curves. It's interesting. It's not looking too bad. It's not super stretchy though, so you really gotta cut in those reliefs so it'll actually fit and stay against the wall. Same with these little dents over here. All these guys. Not bad though. It's getting there. Okay, here it is. Hours and hours later. We are finally completely covered. All around. The whole thing, man. That took forever. Oh, man. I'm really curious if this is worth it. If it's worth all the time cutting all that crap up and pushing it around and filling the gaps and all that crap. So here is how much we got left. Not bad. So for a 30 foot, I probably used maybe 20 of it, maybe a little less. I don't know. I don't really feel like stretching it all out and measuring it, but 
30 foot will definitely do you. Cool. Well, I guess the only thing now is to uh, plug it in and see if it all catches on fire and burns the house down. <laughs> okay, here it is. It's all set up. You can see inside the window. Nice little view of the board. That's awesome. Welcome to hell. So I'm going to be uh, very precautious watching this thing to make sure uh, everything doesn't catch on fire and go kapoof. Okay, so we are at about 214, 215 Celsius. Definitely got some smoke going on here. I'm trying to keep an eye on it. I don't see anything on fire just yet. <laughs> but definitely some smoke. Hopefully that's just the glue burning off or whatever. Or whatever has to happen. Let's see how it goes. We're at 250, so this is as hot as it usually gets. So I'm probably going to cut the power very shortly. She's still smoking a little bit, so I actually have my uh, fume extractor from the uh, 3D printer. A little fan that goes outside. Just to suck any of that crap out. It's definitely holding heat a lot more than uh, before. So in case uh, you were wondering, does it get a uh, hot? Yeah, it gets hot. <laughs> the board is absolutely destroyed. So uh, yeah, I guess pushing it up to 280. Now the heat is so focused. I mean, this has been through a lot of uh, cycles. It's probably its fourth or fifth uh, cycle. You wouldn't normally do a board this much. But wow, that absolutely cooks it. As for the... Uh, our sticky stuff, it's kind of unsticking in spots. So, uh, yeah, we'll see how long that holds up for. Well, there's the, uh, the poor test child. <laughs> All this stuff literally, like, melted out of it. It's insane. I think it gets a little hot. So, yeah, that's just a board getting up to 280. The maximum, the absolute maximum is 260. So now you can see why. Now, as we look into the oven, if we check the top over here, and notice it's starting to get black. So it looks like our tape is starting to burn. So that's not good. Looks like our fiberglass business isn't quite uh, set up to handle super high heat. So that sucks. And it would be really nice because that is the hotter element. I wish I could move that one to the bottom. Because the heat rises so it might not... I mean even the down below you can see that edge right there is getting a little crisp. So yeah, this, this particular tape not really up to the task, which sucks. Okay, so here is what a one foot by two foot sheet of a half inch ceramic insulation blanket gets you. It's thick and it's weird. It's got like a like a crunchy feel to it. Like you can just feel the fibers and everything. So yeah, we're wearing gloves. I don't want to get this crap all over. Even just picking the blanket up, I'm seeing a bunch of little particles and shit like falling off of it. Probably ceramic thingy dingies. So yeah, just be careful with this stuff. I don't know about any airborne issues, but it'll probably make your skin itchy, so just be careful. So we're going to try to cut it around the, uh, the heating elements and the wires. Especially over here, we need to leave access so we can actually uh, put the solid state relay in later. But hopefully we can just cut through this with some scissors and uh, make it look all pretty. Okay, check it out. So here we got the, uh, the ceramic uh, mat all wrapped around. So I cut a little hole out for this guy. This one I just put a little slice. And it actually met in the middle perfectly. I couldn't have done that if I freaking tried. Here's the other side. I just did a slit all the way down and tried to expose it, but it's so close you can't really do much. So it's about as good as it's going to get. I got the front tucked in here, but from what I've heard from other builds, it's usually really hard to fit the top back on. And as you can see, it's already really high, so... It's going to be difficult, especially I think it's this part, so we might have to trim the metal a little. But yeah, as long as we can get it to just kind of sit on there for the most part and maybe press it down a bit, that is thick and awesome. So we'll hook the spring back up, and we still have all this room for electronics, and it'll be well, well protected from the heat. You can see all the ceramic like powder and stuff all over the place, so you know, be careful where you do this. 
you know, don't do it on your kitchen table or somewhere you might eat or anything like that. I'm gonna have to clean the area pretty well. But yeah, looking good. Okay, so I just cut so I just cut this lip so that it's the same height all the way around. Dude, tin snips burn through that like it's nothing. Cuts like butter. Then we just filed it down so it's hopefully not razor sharp anymore. So hopefully that'll slide in a little bit better. As the great Ed once said, it's as snug as a bug in a rug. So I've actually got the uh, remainder just sitting underneath just for now. But yeah, she's together. A little uh, more white and sparkly than before, but you know. So I guess we're going to run the, uh, the tests a couple times and uh, see how it does. All right, well, the stats are in. We can finally see uh, <laughs> if all that hard work paid off. So we've got three different um, profiles here. We've got the red one, which is our final uh, setup with the heat wrap. We got the green one, which was just the gold tape. And then the purple was stock. So as we can see, uh, I lined them all up at around 100 C. So we can kind of get a, a good idea of how they all trickle off. And for the most part, um, you know, I mean, the stock was definitely slower than the rest. So adding the, the tape helped uh, speed things up. And it's also a lot less jagged. Uh, the red one is actually really smooth. I'm impressed. There's not really any jagged marks to it, so it, it'll help keep the uh, the temperature at a steady level. Um, but it kind of seems like it took slightly longer to heat up, and it definitely takes a lot longer to cool down. It's ridiculous how much longer it takes. So, uh, yeah, it might be worth having something that opens the door just a little bit to uh, help it cool faster, but not too fast. So, um, is it worth it? Eh, I really don't know. It's kind of hard to say. I mean, just the gold tape is, is pretty nice. The red is about the same, except it just takes longer to cool down. So if I were to do it again, it might be worth it to just get more uh, heat-resistant tape and just like do the doors and edges and maybe call it good. I don't know if we really need all that heat retention or not. Good for slow cooling, but eh. And here's some numbers. So I set all the start points to uh, 50 C now. So that's when it first started to kind of warm up a little bit. So as we can see, uh, all the, the times here are in seconds. Uh, and this is from one section to the next. So we actually got a 14 second reduction in uh, the initial warm up time, which was kind of nice. So it definitely warms up faster. Uh, the reflow, like getting to the reflow stage is the same amount. So in every single case, it took the same amount to ramp from 150 up to getting ready to reflow. And then the actual reflow stage took uh, five seconds less. So that's nice. The less time we can spend in this stage, the better. And uh, we have an increase of 253 seconds uh, in the cooling stage, which is ridiculous. So for those that would like to do some quick math, that is four uh, minutes and 21 seconds longer <laughs> so that's insane so it definitely holds in heat better and it can warm up a little faster so it has improved now here's the other thing where the this is the temperature differential uh, between it so we can see our, our initial warm-up stage the blue line is our heat wrap red is gold and green is our stock so you can see the stock one was jumping around quite a bit a really really messy reading um, but the uh, the blue and the red definitely seem to uh, normalize, and uh, yeah, I guess that's better for less component stress. And you can see with the blue, I mean, this thing's damn near a perfect line. It it takes forever to cool down, so we could definitely drop down to like one down here. You can see the gold tape. It dipped down a little lower than it should have, but for the most part, you know, not bad. Crack the door open a bit, we could get a much uh, faster cool down time while still being in a safe level. But anyway, there's the data. So hopefully that was uh, interesting. <laughs> Ugh, what, a, what a mess. So if I were to do this again, yeah, definitely get some higher temp tape at the very least. All right, I think it's finally time to go for gold. So here's our first test subject, a very poorly uh, done SMD jack. So I guess we're going to put that in the oven and see how it does. OK, 
get the probe uh, fairly close to that and uh, do this manually and uh, <laughs> hope for the best. Should be interesting. Windows getting a little foggy. I'm gonna have to clean it off. All that damn smoke pouring out. So you can't really see it too well, but uh, the probe is definitely touching the board. So we'll let that heat up and uh, try to keep an eye on it, but can't really film at the same time. So I'll let you know what the uh, results are. Okay, well, it reflowed. So now we're on the cooling phase, so the power's off, and we're just going to let it kind of chill. I'm probably going to crack the door open just so it'll cool a little faster. I'm tired of sitting here for minutes. Alright, it's time to open up the floodgates. So I was looking at some leaded profile um, things. So for the initial cooldown, it shouldn't be any faster than uh, 2 degrees Celsius per second. And then for the uh, after 100, it can be a maximum of 3 Celsius per second. This display updates once per second. You can see we're still fine. In the, the cooler temperatures, it takes longer to cool down anyway. So there it is. Most of it's okay, but uh, you can see some solder gaps, but that's because I used way too much. But hey, we know it works. Board isn't destroyed, and the, uh, the jack isn't you know, warped and melted, so that's really cool. I'm excited. <laughs> this is gonna be great once I actually get the relay and can use it properly. If you look at the um the pins that are properly flow, I definitely used way too much. Like the one on the left is probably what you'd normally see. Where you don't really see the solder ball up on the top of the pin, it's just on the bottom. That's cool. Not bad. I guess now it's time to uh, populate a more important board. We well, say we try one of the Trinity controllers since I actually have all the parts on hand. There's a lot of little bitties in there. Should be uh, exciting. I, mean, I got stencils for them so I can do that the right way. All right, here's our first full test board right here. A completely populated board. This thing took hours to put together, but this is the first one of the batch, so I need to uh, figure out the whole parts list and where it all fits and how it fits and all that crap. So I think we're ready to go baking. Oh boy. Okay, here's the moment of truth. How she reflow? Okay. So looking at this, you'll notice that the uh, some components fell off. I'm not sure what happened there. I don't know if they got knocked off by the um, the temperature probe, or if they like popped up or did something weird. But the voltage regulator popped up and set it a capacitor. That's weird. If you notice, I got this potholer. I've got a two-stage thing. We've got where it's just open a crack for when it's real hot, so it cools kind of slow. And then as it cools down, we just crack it open more and more. Okay. So here's the aftermath of uh, our first test board. So as you can see, the components that actually stayed where they were supposed to look pretty good. I don't really have any complaints with that. Especially if you look at like the, the pins over here. Most of them don't look half bad. It looks like there might be one solder joint over there. On the bottom of the chip, right in the middle, I think. Not sure what the heck happened over here. You see that one capacitor uh, didn't quite do something. I think uh, one of the capacitors to the crystal got knocked in between the resistor over there. That's kind of silly. Um, over here, all these guys look fairly decent. Fucking catastrophic failure over here. I don't know what the heck happened. Yeah, the regulator just like completely flipped over and just shit everywhere. I I don't even know what to say. I really don't. It's nuts. Okay, after a lot of fun rework later, everything is where it belongs. Hooray. So now we don't have any more 
missing inductors or uh, capacitors bridging or uh, voltage regulators that are just up and gone. So it's not too bad. Okay, so it looks like we're going to need a lot more practice with fine pitch because um, this uh, relay driver over here, almost every single frickin' pin was shorted together, man. It's terrible. I plugged it in and the, the thing got up to like 230 degrees. Luckily the uh, fused protection I have on this board is working so nothing uh, pops or does anything catastrophic so that's cool. Turn on the thermal camera, this thing's glowing bright red. So we're going to try to uh, reflow these damn pins and uh, see if that fixes our problem. Okay, so I've taken care of all the bridges. No more bridges. Flux is your friend. Clean it out where you can. I even found uh, a few more on the main chip. There's a, a couple others that were together. What a pain in the butt. Okay, so now everybody's good. I plugged it into USB. We're getting the proper voltage. There's nothing hot, nothing short now. Good to go. Alright, so we're back into the toaster oven. Uh, we've had some uh, numerous trial runs to see how it does. We can see our ceramic blanket is doing excellent. It hasn't really uh, fallen apart, burning or anything, so this super awesome, really nice insulator. The tape, on the other hand, however, has been kind of sucking butt. So, really the only bad part is up at the top. It's starting to get black and it smokes if you run it for too long. So I've had to been, uh, I had to run like the fume extractor to uh, help circumvent that, but yeah, you have to pay the money for the expensive tape. You know, the rolls that run you like $56 on Amazon, those are rated to 850 degrees, unlike this, which is 550. Guess you need the extra heat, because it freaking stinks in there. Oh well, live and learn. Hell, even the thermal couple that I got with the kit is uh, starting to turn black. I don't know if you can see the color difference, but it's getting a little, a little toasty. So anyway, our final piece to the puzzle came in. This is a Crydom solid state relay. This is the D242510. So this is our 25 amp model, which was actually cheaper than the 10 amp model. So I figured, eh, why not? So this is rather simple. If you've ever messed with relays before, we've got our output side, one and two, which are connected together. And we have our input side, which is, you know, when you run power through it, it'll flip the other side on. The nice thing about a solid state is there's no mechanical parts, so this thing can turn on and off really fast. This controller doesn't use PWM or anything really fast like that, but it does still switch it off kind of fast. You don't want to hear the relay click, 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 click. So that's why we got this guy. It lasts long and does the job. And uh, in case you're trying to source your own, it's important that the input is anywhere from 3 to 5 volts, because that's all this guy puts out. It might only put out 3 volts, I'm not sure. And the uh, output can take 240 volts AC, which is nice. We're only running 120 here, but still. Smoke them if you got them, right? So, uh, yeah, we got the cover off. And all we're going to do is clip our positive line uh, over here. I think I'm going to hotwire the um, our finger dingers into there. But we also need somewhere to mount our screen. And if you notice, we're not going to be using this section here. This is just a fancy like diode thing that like turns a certain oven, uh, a certain element on or off because there is a diode in here. So uh, we can junk this one completely. The uh, the timer over here is like near purely mechanical. So uh, yeah, I'm thinking about taking this middle one out and mounting the display in there instead. Wouldn't that be freaking baller? The only issue I'm seeing is how to like what to do with the buttons. Unless this sticks out a little, I, I don't know. I'll have to figure out some kind of button extension. Or um, desolder them and add my own longer ones. I don't know. Yeah, that was a piece of cake. So the button is just a friction fit. Just got to pull on it kind of hard. She'll pop out. And you got two Phillips head screws that are uh, holding it on. And she's free. Cool. So, we'll have to uh, get the dangerous Dremel out for this guy. But I'm thinking uh, mount the screen somewhere in there like that, huh? That'd be kind of neat. Either that or go whole hog and figure out how this switch works and hook this switch up to that switch. I'm telling you, that wouldn't be cool to like click it one way and... Hmm. And then what we'll do instead is pull the temperature knob out instead. Because then it would be up at the top. Ooh, that would be cool. That would be so cool. Anyway, uh, I want to show this off right here. This is a very interesting mechanism. 
I'm not entirely sure how it all functions, but we've got a knob over here that actually uh, tightens in and out slightly. And if you notice, we have a metal tab that's under tension, and we've got two copper contacts. So see that? That's what actually turns the oven on and off. And when I tighten it down a lot, see how it bows? When I take it out, it starts to open up again. So this must be some kind of mechanically um, actuated temperature control. Because there's a part over here that hooks up to the side of the oven, I guess to, to measure like how hot the side of the oven is, and then this thing will flick on and off with the heat. I think that's crazy. That's really impressive that they can make something work like that so simply. You know, when you're you're on a budget and you got to think clever, it's interesting the ingenuity you'll find in products. Anyway, I think I'm gonna map out this switch and see if uh, we can use it. So I got ideas now. Okay, so I got the switch out, and you know me, I can't leave anything alone. So we've got a diagram of our little toaster oven. So over to the left is our entire wiring diagram. We have our negative AC and our positive AC. So the, um, the positive starts out with a timer, so the timer is our main cutoff switch, and then it runs all the way up to the temperature knob, so that is our secondary cutoff switch. So if the timer is on and the temperature is... Um, low, then the select switch gets power. So there are two um, selectors here that get power, and there are three outputs. So we have this one right here, which goes to our top heater, and I got this one here, which goes to our bottom heater. But there's a special one over here that also goes to the bottom through a diode. Now this right here, I'm pretty sure is just voltage regulation. They're using it more as like a resistor rather than a diode. They're just dropping the voltage to the um to the bottom element so it, it's uh it's cooler so it's basically just a, a lower bottom and then over here i have all the switches so we've got our five um in, our five uh connectors they're all labeled we have our two positive our one our two and our two d which is just low so over on broil we just have the top heater on on bagel we have the top heater and we have uh the bottom uh on low on bake, we have one and two, so that's full blast. On warm, we just have the two diodes, so that is the, uh, that's probably the coldest mode. And then we have toast, which is the same as bake, just one and two. So you can see right here, you know, they just have either both of them jumped or, you know, on this one they got one and that. So it's just interesting to see how the switch does its things. So, yeah, we've got a couple different uh, selectors we can use, so that's neat. Now just to decide if I actually want them to be used as inputs, because you don't want the button to be held down the entire time, I'm pretty sure. You just want it to be uh, momentary. So you'd have to click it and then click it back. So I don't know. I'll have to decide. But that's uh, what the wiring looks like, in case you were curious. Okay, so apparently this is just going to become a, a uh, toaster bolter. So uh, I actually pulled the switch apart, because you can just lift the tabs out. And... Uh, once you get one side free, you can kind of just wiggle the thing out. So it's an interesting little design. Uh, before we get into that, I guess I'll show you the specifics here. So the switch is rated for 250 volts AC, 16 amps. And it is a uh, Huli, Huli Lai switch. I don't know. All the terminals are labeled. You get A, B, 2, 4, and... Uh, I guess three and one wasn't important. <laughs> but uh, anyway, first we'll look at the switch contacts over here. So the uh, on this one right here, you can see the two contacts, one, one on the left and one on the right. So the right one is constantly in contact, and the left one is actuated by a spring-loaded switch. So when we push this down, and if I can push it down, the, uh, it'll make and break that contact. So that's what actually makes and breaks the contact. Now over here you notice there's a spring and a ball with a little grease on there. That's just for the clicky action. So that's what gives it the nice um, retention because without it, it just spins wherever it wants. So if we actually look at the switch design here, you can see a bunch of uh, pockets 
uh, towards the back. That's what the ball is right on. That's what makes it. That's what gives the clicky action. And then what actually makes the selection is the big square nubs that stick out there. So what we can do is try to modify this switch by uh, taking out nubs or adding nubs to try to get a uh, switch action that we want. So I may do that so that um, I can set it up so like center is off and then we can click it to turn it on or click it the other way to uh, switch the selector. And then we'll just run the switch wires over to these guys. So I'll have to look into the mechanics more, figure out what how I want the buttons to work, but I might be onto something here. One final um, last thing that I noticed on this, this is inverted. Okay, so if you look at these switches, they are constantly closed and it requires an action to open them. So what, what that means is that when there's a hole like this, this is considered a hole on this side where it's it's got a divot, that is on because there's no action. And then when you turn it, say, like to the left, now there's this giant nub which pushes down and that's what opens it. So the nub is off and a hole is on. So in order to be able to do what we want, we want uh, two nubs. We want a nub on uh, either side when we're in the up position. And then when we rotate it, say, to the left, we want a hole just on this side. And when we rotate it to the right, we want a hole just on this side. So this one has our hole. And it's off when we're up top. So the right side is good. So now all we got to do is come over here, and I guess uh, we'll have to dremel out the nub here and figure out how to add something there. And then we should have the switch action that we need. Through the powers of the mighty vise, we can uh, squeeze on this just enough to kind of get the these edges to bulge out. And then with a flathead, you can kind of pry this guy out. So now we've got our marks. So if there's a mark on a dimple, then we need to fill it up. And if there's marks on something that sticks out, then we need to uh, cut it down. So I'm still deciding what I'm going to use for filler, but uh, at least we can do the cutting down part with a Dremel. Well, I guess that'll have to do it. I just got the hot glue gun out. <laughs> it's the best thing I could find on short notice. Thinking some kind of maybe a quick setting epoxy might be slightly better, but this has gotten hard enough. It should be able to actuate the contacts. Alright, cool. Our switch was a success. Got it all back together again. I made sure to put a white mark on the uh, the other side so I knew the proper orientation of the switch. How it all went together. But now it still clicks. Goes one way and the other. Now this side's a little soft because of how much hot glue is there. It doesn't like really nicely snap back in. But this side's nice and that's the one that we're gonna use the most because that's gonna be the big cycle. So we'll click it and click it off, and then it'll be good to go. And that'll be to reset the um, the profile if needed. Cool. And it's pretty simple. So this one will be for the uh, the bake side. So we'll hook uh, these two to that switch. And uh, this will be for the reset side, so we'll hook one of those. Neat. So I will reinstall that, and instead we're going to put the screen up here. So what do you think? A little, a little something like this. We'll center it up screen action. We'll just cut it out and have it stick through. I think that's good. Our screen size is going to be that big for the entire border, so it'll be a little overlapping, but yeah, we'll cut and see what we think. I like where this is going. Also, trying to get this knob off. What a pain in the butt. I had to pry on that pretty hard to get that damn uh, this stupid thing out. So this one, the shaft is on the switch. It'll come off. You just got to pry on it. All right, here we are in the shop. So I decided to test out whether I wanted a, uh, a full cutout frame or not. I like the full cutout better. So I traced it on there, just for uh, reference. Look a little something like that. The other option was that it isn't cut out nearly as much. It looks a little cleaner, kind of, but I know I'm not gonna be able to pull that off, so I'm just gonna have it stick out. So, we got our line traced. I guess we're going to go to town with the Dremel, see if we can uh, get through it. So I got the uh, first piece cut out right there. I'm just using this, uh, like, I guess, I don't know if it's like a diamond encrusted um, grind wheel or something like that, but um, it does well. The, the trick is first you have to get a cut into it 
because that that part takes forever but then you you figure out which way the wheels going and once you go in it'll dig right through you got to give it a lot of speed and it'll it'll cut but you can't back you can't go the the other way because it'll it'll jump and bounce on you like crazy but anyway the screen will sit somewhere in there like that so I'm going to use a file now just to clean up the sharp edges and uh, see if I can get this to fit a little nicer, but we're getting there. So we got the screen cut out, got all the edges deburred, fits in there pretty well. Not too bad. It'll do well. It'll, it'll do just fine for a $30 toaster oven. So uh, I've got two holes drilled at the bottom to meet, uh, to mount up with the LCD. So that'll be the main uh, way that the screen is held onto the, the toaster. So with those two screws, that should be fairly firmly mounted. And then I'll just bend this so that it's pressing against the board for slightly extra upper support. I'm going to put some uh, electrical tape on the LCD pins so they don't short out against the case. And uh, that should be kind of taken care of. If you notice, we got a, a right angle header adapter on there. Uh, the USB port is too close to the side of the oven to actually plug anything in. So we're going to have to do this the manual way. I found myself uh, some old uh, like type A USB, or is this type B, I don't remember, but you know, one of these cords you're never going to freaking use. I already got three of them laying around. So uh, we're going to use just a simple wall adapter like this guy, USB port. We're going to take this guy and we're going to snip. So we got this end, I'm going to wire the 5-volt uh, the in the ground right into the 5-volt five five in ground on here because that's attached to a regulator for the three volt uh, supply for the board. So then we'll just take this guy and uh, tap it into the power somewhere. And that'll be good. Now, onto the wiring. So first, we got a nice little access hole here for the thermocouple to slide through. That is excellent. Uh, we have our switch mounted so that we uh, will we'll have to wire that into the board so we have our, our inputs so that we can select uh, one or the other. Uh, for the main power, I have decided to actually keep this functional. So when you turn it to off, it will be off. And when you turn it to on, it'll supply power to everything. So we have our hotline going in over there, and then we have our hotline, our switched hot coming out. Now that switched hot is going to go into pin one of our, uh, our relay. So that is the output side. And then both of the heaters are directly wired up to this output. So when this gives the OK, the heaters get power. But we also have this nice safety cutoff switch here, which is cool. Uh, currently the LED is hooked up to the, um, the sort of always hot line. So this light will turn on whenever the toaster is like in an on position. But I think it'd be nicer to have it uh, set up to run with the um, with the elements. So what I need to do is snip that wire and put it on the output side of the relay so it turns on and off with the, uh, the heater. So that'll be good. And I'm just using uh, ring terminals for these guys. If you ever, I got bags of these things laying around. Uh, due to the wire gauge, I'm using the red size because these are these are real tiny. But just these guys, I'm just uh, taking off a little insulation, crimping them together. So yeah, we need two for the input that we will plug into the board. We need to run the thermocouple back in the board. And we need to solder on some uh, wires for our switch to be functional. So our, uh, our, our light wire has been extended and put on the switch side. So now our, uh, our switched power is all good. So I think all the, just about all the 120 volt stuff is good. So now we're just down to low power. And then uh, we got to hook up the adapter later. Uh, so we've got two wires here for the solid state relay. Our white one is the positive, our brown one is the negative. And the nice thing is, on here it actually says which one is which. It says SSR positive and negative is being covered. So we got those two there. Um, I also have a little jack here for our positive and negative for the USB. I just cut it open. It's going to be four wires. You're going to have red, black, white, and green. The white and green are data lines. Red and black are, you know, positive and negative, respectively. So now we have our power. We have our solid state relay control. Uh, so the only thing left to do is the buttons now. 
And if we take a look at the uh, the board here, you can see we've got two push button switches that are momentary, and uh, the like the long side of the legs are connected. So that top left is connected to the top uh, to the bottom left, and so forth. The bottom right is connected to the top right. So as we can see, we've got two um, what looks like to be pull-up resistors or divider resistors, some kind of um, network there. So we can tell that the inner legs are the um, the inputs, and I actually measured, and the outer legs are ground. And if you look really carefully on the silk screen, you can actually see where they make uh, contact. See so see the four little like the lines that come out in the middle. That means that those are connected to ground. So we only need to run three wires to get our switches. We need one ground, and uh, we need the two, like one for each switch. So I'm going to connect three four, three wires, just going to solder them right onto those pins, and uh, then we will appropriately connect them up to our tabs over here. Basically, we can just do ground and ground on one side, and on the other, switch one and switch two. So uh, I might even try to reuse these tabs that are sitting around here. We've got a few wires laying around. One, two, three. We might have enough. Uh, all right, so here's the fun part. We got our three wires over here. Each one has their own little end on here. Good to go. And I actually reused the power wire for the ground, so now we have our jumper for both sides. So now we get to actually do some SMD soldering, kind of, sort of. So I got a little bit of um, flux on there. That should help uh, wet the joints, get everything flowing real nice. I want to dab each joint one, one at a time and get them connected. Should be good. All right, we got some nice beefy joints on there. So the uh, should resist falling off. So I think that just about does it. All of our uh, our business is done ski. Okay, so we got our switches hooked up ground to ground. Switch one, switch two. And check it. So we have our dial right here. Rotate it to the left. It changes our uh, our temperature profile. See it says uh, PB for lead. Hmm. Lead free. And then when you turn it to the right, it actually starts. And flick it again, and it'll cancel it. <laughs> oh, that's so cool! So we turn it to bagel to change our profile, then we turn it to warm to make boards. Cool! Alright, she's currently live. We are armed and dangerous, gentlemen. <coughs> Should I forget anything in there? Okay, so uh, if we turn this to the right, I'm actually going to turn the light off so you can see this better. Oh my god, look! The toaster's on! The light's on! The light's on with the heater. I can hear it buzzing. Oh, that is so friggin' cool! Dude! She's going! Oh my god! And then we can click it again to cancel it. Oh my god, that is so cool! Oh! Dude! I just built my own friggin' reflow oven! Holy crap, this is awesome! Yeah, the, the switch right here, so alright, let's try that. So we'll turn it on, right? We'll go to preheat. I see the lights on, go to off, and it turns off. Look at that. Oh man, so now I got built in safety as well. Oh man. <laughs> You're damn straight, it's hot! This thing is on fire! Oh man, this is cool as hell. But look at it! Oh my god, that looks so cool! Dude, this is a pimp daddy oven right here. I'm just like... Bruh! That is so fucking cool! Ah. Oh my god! Okay, so it's finally time to wire up our plug over here. Uh, so I only have 22 gauge wire laying around, which is kind of tiny. Now this thing only pulls, it's, it says on there on the adapter, it only pulls 150 milliamps of current. So that's nothing. 
you know, just for safety's sake, I'm doubling it up. Uh, but the thing I wanted to show is when you twist wire, uh, you would think that you just sit there and just twist it down the line, right? I mean, you can, but it'll probably unravel on you. The problem is you're you're putting that twisting force into it and it wants to, you know, torque out and separate. So the proper way to twist wire together and actually keep it together is instead of actually twisting, what you're doing is wrapping them around each other. And I don't know if I can show you because this is definitely two-handed work. So this is going to be kind of terrible because I'm doing it one-handed, but instead of sitting there and twisting, you know, like this and working your way down, all you're doing is kind of moving them one in front of the other. So you're kind of picking them up and twisting them around like that. So you're not actually exerting any twisting force, you're just wrapping them around each other. And that's how you make a nice coil that doesn't, you know, come flying apart the second you let go. So anyway, we're going to wrap those ends around each other. One's going to go to the um, our common hot after the switch. And um, the ground, I'm just going to tap into the ground line over here. And then we're done. So as far as polarity goes, we have a big one over here. And we got a small one. The nice thing about this wire is that the uh, markings are only on one side of the wire so we can trace it down. So the small one, if you'll see, we got markings over here as our positive. So the small is the positive and the big one is the negative. Um, now for our charger over here, this is non-polarity specific. Both of them are small, so you can plug it in either way, it doesn't matter. But if you do have to plug it in a certain way, make sure you get your polarity right. So make sure that the big one gets your ground and the small one gets your positive. Now uh, these spade connectors are not uh, meant to fit on these. These are a lot thicker than a normal spade, so I'm opening them up with a flathead uh, just enough to spread those little terminals apart and then we'll kind of just tappy tap tap it on the rest of the way. Then she'll be right. I'm using fully insulated jackets so uh, you know just in case they touch anything they're a-okay. And I probably shouldn't have to mention this, but just in case, make sure you always have this thing unplugged when you're working on it. If you're inside this thing at all, all right, at all, unplug the thing. You really don't want to be messing around when these things are hot, because you're going to have a bad time when you mess up. So anyway, got our positive to our uh, positive, got our ground to our ground, and we are done, son. That's everything. Moment of truth. Do she blow up? Hey, 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 it turns on. That's so cool. And check this out. Go like this. Yeah, buddy. Oh, yes. Dude. So friggin' cool. Holy crap. I am proud of this thing, man. This is sweet. All right, well, here it is. Finished product. This is what we've all been waiting for. So we've got our, uh, our USB charger over here, zip tied, all wired up. All the other wires zip tied and cleaned up and uh, try to make it look as nice as possible. We got our uh, ceramic mat back in place. We've got our screen in there with our USB cable running down the back. We got all our wires for that, for the controller stuff, all sitting there, nice tucked away, pretty like. <laughs> Got the relay. Yeah, I think she's all set. All right, check it out. There it is, the final product. The Franken Reflower is done. Ain't that party. So we got our, uh, our probe sitting in there, got our tray, all of our reflective crap. Good to go. And my favorite part. The controller. Oh, that is so cool. Alright, so got another one of these boards, very terribly uh, just quickly thrown together, some old paste. We're gonna see how she do. So we're gonna slide that in there and uh, go to town. We're on our PB profile. 
and she's running. So if you turn this off, you can barely make it out in the corner, but you can see the red light blinking. Come down here, see our red light's on, and hopefully, very shortly, there you go. Yep. Heater one, heater two. Sweet baby Jesus. Oh, that is so badass. Okay, so we were almost all good, except the um, the thermal couple's reading like really slowly. Either that or just the interior, like the air temperature is really low, but we're already seeing smoke and it's only reading 43. Usually by this point it's well into the 150s. Like, she's hot. The solder already reflowed. Or I wired it backwards, but the temperature is climbing instead of going down, so I think it's properly wired. Uh, weird. It's a little bit of a bummer, considering I sat there and screwed it all together. But you can see the solder reflowed, so it was definitely hot. Okay, so I decided to tear into the toaster just to see what was going on, and I found out that the second I started to take the case off, it started to work a little better. Um, so I decided to pull everything out, and here we got the probe over here. So we do the finger test. Look at that. We jump right up to 34 almost instantly. We let go, and the, uh, the temperature starts to drop. So that's much better than the, uh, the time we were having before. So I found that our wire was like cocked over to the side like this. So when I hold it to the side like that, and now I'm grabbing onto the sensor, well now of course it works. But however it was sitting, it must have, uh, something must have not been right. Because I noticed that depending on the location of how this thing is bent, uh, it wasn't working. It might have actually been touching, maybe the, uh, the thing down here was twisted or touching each other, because that's how the, um, this thing works. This is a really, really sensitive device. So if you come in here, there's actually a, uh, like a split, kind of looks like the end of a, a needle or something. And uh, wherever the metal is making contact, that is the point that it's sensing temperature. So if, for instance, this was twisted enough that these two wires were touching each other, well, that's our new temperature point, and, you know, that's why we would never see a, a temperature change, is because it's, uh, you know, you're not really going to see much. So it's really, really important that you have these wires properly routed. So uh, I'm going to see if I can bend this a little differently so that it still works. But it's very comforting to know that our sensor isn't toast. I actually looked up the data sheet, and it's good up to like 380 degrees Celsius or something, so we didn't get anywhere near that. So good to know that even though the outside jacket is black, the sensor still works. Just got to make sure the wiring is good. All right, so we've got another uh, test unit set up. So crank it on. And uh, real quick, we will make sure that our probe is working. So grab it. There we go. Jumps almost instantly up to 34. And seems to cool back down fairly quickly, too. So that is what we want. Nice, fast response time. Okay, cool. We shall close the oven and turn it on. That is so freaking cool. I'm really happy that this thing, like, that, that the knobs are functional. It makes this build so much cooler. Okay, so I just wanted to uh, note, you can see the red light turning on and off, which is really cool. We can see exactly what the solid state relay is doing, so I'm very happy I hooked the light up to that. And uh, if we look onto the display itself, we can see that we're in the, sto the, the soak stage right now. So we're sitting around 165C. You can see that little relay is blinking on and off. And then you can see it's a little little dimmer in there now. So the uh well this this phone does get fairly bright. That's closer to what the actual light looks like. Alright, now we're at the reflow stage. We are at 190C. Two hundred C two ten C All right, I 
think all right, it just cooled it cut power. We're at 225 now. And there you go. Now it's in the cooling stage. So that's pretty much it in a nutshell. That's the whole the whole kit caboodle and kabang. Sorry the uh, glass is foggy, you can't really see. You can see the solder is still going even though it's cooling down. We're at 220 right now. So it's definitely nice to let it sit in there for a bit longer so that it can actually uh, do everything. But there you go. Cooked to a nice golden brown. Almost no uh, jumps there too. So we really just need the tiniest little bit of solder. I tried to go kind of light on that, but I don't have a thin nozzle. But there you go. Doesn't look like there's any bubbling on the jack, and the joints look really nice. All right, she's a success. I'm a happy with that. Very nice, very nice. It's a little Franken toaster that could, man. This is cool beans. But it does smell. It stinks like a mother. So I really got to do this uh, not inside. It's terrible. I really can't deal with it. It's just ugh. No es bueno. Look at this monster, dude. Oh my god, this thing is like a mini computer. Look at all the crap on this. Look at it all. There's so much. I'm super pumped. So let us see how this one turns out. Alright, so we're going to try to repurpose the uh, 3D printer <laughs> to uh, be used as a fume extractor. So I just took the top off of it because it fits rather well. It's not going to sit on there for long, so the plastic should melt, especially with all that good insulation we have in there. So we'll see if that helps uh, suck out some of the heat, uh, some of the fumes. And again, this shouldn't be a problem if you use tape that's properly rated, or just don't put it on the hot bits. Whatever. Alright, so now we're in the cooling phase. This little guy definitely did a lot better. The stink is a lot lower, but uh, I might need to seal it a little better over by the window. You can still smell it a little, but more over on that side, so that's good. It is taking most of it away. I don't know how this is going to do long term again with how hot this is. Uh, I don't know if the plastic is going to start to get weak or anything. But, you know, just for testing inside, it's good enough for now. It could use a stronger fan, could use better sealing, but still better than nothing. So anyway, on to the main prize. Look at that beautiful bastard, would you? I'm impressed. I'm not seeing a whole lot to complain about here, man. I think we're on to something. Look at that, huh? I'll have to look a lot closer when she's out, but I don't see any jumps. All the components are sitting where they're supposed to. Looking good. Not seeing anything tombstoned. Not seeing anything shorted or jumped or anything real bad. Looks like there's a little, uh, oh no, that's just a via, okay. Yeah, man. That's looking awesome. Cool. Very cool. I think we're onto something. This thing is awesome. But you can most definitely use any old Walmart brand or any old cheapo brand toaster to get the job done. So, that is awesome. That is my toaster oven build. I doubt much else is going to be done with it. So, uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully you enjoyed the ride. Alrighty. Peace.